All right, it is great uh, to have you worshiping with us. Our first official, official service. Today is the birthday of Good News Church, and we are really excited that you uh, would come to celebrate that with us and be a part of that with us. This is my beautiful wife, Mika. My name is Thomas, and uh, Mika's going to address you for just a moment, and then I'll grab the mic and say something else. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming today and celebrating with us. This is just a monumental, special day for us, and we are honored that you would just come celebrate with us. So thank you. I do want to ask that if you would, there's a 100% chance that we won't remember everybody who was here today, but we want to. So if you don't mind filling out the back of this card, we're not asking for your social security number, nothing like too, too deep and personal, but if you don't mind filling this out, and then uh, if you don't know, we're giving everybody free lunch today. So if, um, if you can stay and eat with us, just drop it in the, the bucket at the food truck. It's not like you have to turn this in to get your meal, but it would be nice if you would. If you can't stay for lunch, there's another bucket right there beside the door. You can drop it in there. Um, if you are visiting from another church, then send your greetings back to your church and thank you for coming. But if you are looking for a church family, we would be so delighted if you wanted to just be part of our family. We're all about connecting and doing life together. So um, there's a place you can just check at the bottom if you would be interested in more information about how to be part of your new church family. And yeah, thanks again for being here. So, Nikki didn't make one mistake. She did say, if you stay and eat with us, no, you will stay and eat with us. Uh, there are people barricading the parking lot afterwards, all right? Uh, there is a wonderful Christian man named Michael that has concocted this idea that you can combine Cajun food with Mexican food. And I think it's brilliant. And so he's serving jam burritos for free uh, outside from his food truck after the service. And we will not let your car leave the parking lot unless we smell your breath and we smell jam burritos coming off your breath. So you have to stay and eat lunch with us. Okay? It's already been paid for. There are hundreds of generous uh, believers all around uh, America that have paid for this church to be sponsored and to begin churches in Florida, churches in North Carolina, churches in Tennessee, uh, churches here in Arizona that have sown seed financially, people that have given generously for us to be able to launch this church and to have this service today. So all of those things are paid for. We have inflatables for the kids. We have a snow cone that will be coming out after that. We have a basketball court for people to play on. We want you to hang out and find out if you like jam burritos or not, and uh, have a seat, talk to somebody, and enjoy the Arizona sunshine. So you are not allowed to, like, uh, take off after the service. You have to hang out, all right? Um, every Sunday at Good News Church, we are committed to doing several things. One of those things we're going to do every Sunday at Good News Church is exalt the name of Jesus. We believe that Jesus is the main event. Jesus is the big deal. There is nothing sweeter, nothing more powerful, nothing better that we can talk about or lift up in the name of Jesus. So every Sunday morning, we're going to celebrate Jesus. We're going to clap. We're going to sing. We're going to make music. We're going to talk about how wonderful he is. We're going to sing about him. Every Sunday morning at Good News Church, we're going to take a moment to pray for our neighbor because one of the most powerful experiences in my life is being prayed for by other people. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times I have been changed because someone took the time to lay their hand on me and pray for me and just believe that God is good and that God wants to do something good in my life. So we're going to do that every Sunday morning at our church. Every Sunday morning at Good News Church when we meet, we're also going to talk about the Bible. We're going to share truth from God's Word. And then every Sunday morning at our church, we're going to take communion. And at the end of our service today, we're going to take communion. And I know that if you're a guest with us today or you're not used to being in church, that will probably freak you out a little bit, and that's okay. We promise that there's nothing too crazy about it. Communion is this symbol that churches all over the world have been doing uh, ever since Jesus was on earth. It's, it's a very, very, very ancient tradition that churches have that we take a small cup of juice or wine. Our church goes juice. It's cheaper than wine. And we take a small piece of bread, and you take the juice and, and the uh, bread and you eat it to commemorate what Jesus has done for you and as an active way of saying, Jesus, I believe in you. Because if you haven't figured it out yet or not, um, we live in a culture where lots of people don't believe in Jesus. And uh, it's okay. We don't hate them for not believing in Jesus. But Jesus is looking for people who publicly believe in him. 
He is. And so our church is going to make that statement. We're going to give you that opportunity every Sunday morning to make that statement in communion uh, of taking the bread, taking the juice and saying, Jesus, I believe in you. This is a Jesus church. You're going to hear the name Jesus a lot. Uh, every Sunday morning, we really think Jesus is what it's all about. But we do want you to know that when we take communion at our church, it is not some kind of a trick. That like, oh, if you take it, you've got to come back next Sunday. Or if you take it, we put your name on the roll and we call you a member. There's nothing like that associated with it. Um, it's just a symbolic, physical thing that we do to appreciate Jesus Christ and to honor Jesus Christ. So if you're here today with children and they're in the service with you, and by the way, we love kids at this church. I've got four of my own, 13-year-old, 11-year-old, 7-year-old, and one and a half year old and I think kids are a blessing. I think kids are wonderful, and uh, we want your child to have a blast today at church. But if you are a parent and you came with kids, we're going to ask you to help make that decision at the end of the service for your child. You understand if your child talks about Jesus and prays to Jesus and they tell you they believe in Jesus and you want your child to take communion, that's great. No problem. If you realize, you know, my child is kind of young. I'm not sure if they really understand the whole Jesus thing and I want them to wait. Then you can just whisper to your child and explain that to them that you want them to wait. And if you're a boy or girl today, we're going to ask you to trust your mom or dad. If they tell you that it's a good thing for you to take communion or if they want you to wait, please know that there's lots of good food for you to eat afterwards. And communion is really not snack time anyway. It won't fill you up. So it's okay if you have to wait till you get outside to eat. But um, we're going to let all the parents in the room make that decision for their family. And we honor you as parents to lead your family spiritually in that decision. So just want to kind of make sure that's clear so when we get to communion at the end that nobody's feeling uh, too awkward about that. And the moms and dads know that you'll lead your family. Today, I want to share with you a message entitled, The Good News Is for Prodigals. The Good News Is for Prodigals. Our church is called Good News Church, and God put that title, that, that, um, that phrase in my heart a long time ago when I kind of went through a season of rediscovering uh, my relationship with Jesus. I grew up in church, been in church all my life. Uh, ever since I was a tiny baby, I've been in church. I've been in thousands of church services, every type and flavor that you can imagine. I've been in some crazy ones where people were shouting, and I've been in some boring ones where everybody was falling asleep. I've been in everything in between. I've been to summer camp and uh, Bible school and Sunday school and kids' church and Bible college. Every flavor of church services you can have, I've been to. And sometimes when you do that on that journey of believing in Jesus, the message of who Jesus is can kind of get dull and calloused inside of you. And I went through a season a couple years ago in my life where I just had a fresh experience with the goodness and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And I kind of met him all over again. And it was so wonderful for me. And in that season that I experienced that, the Lord put it on my heart that when I started this church, it will be called Good News Church because I want us to celebrate the fact that Jesus is good news. Jesus is good news. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So Jesus himself said, I am anointed by God. I am set apart by God. I have come to proclaim a message of good news. And that phrase, good news, in one form or another, appears over 100 times in the New Testament. It's a big theme in the New Testament of the Bible, good news. In Luke chapter 4, verse 43, Jesus said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. So Jesus says, I've come to give good news, and I'm on a mission to give good news. What was the good news that Jesus uh, came to proclaim? It was himself. It was himself. Jesus was the message. He was the message. J. Sidlow Baxter says it like this. Fundamentally, our Lord's message was himself. He did not come merely to preach a gospel. He himself is that gospel. He did not come merely to give bread. He said, I am the bread. He did not come merely to shed light. He said, I am the light. He did not come merely to show the door. He said, I am the door. He did not come to name a shepherd. He said, I am the shepherd. He did not come to point the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus' message was himself. Jesus is the good news. And this morning, I want to pause and pray that as I share for the next few minutes, the reality of Jesus and that he is good news will be crystal clear in this room. So would you take a moment and bow your heads with me to pray?
Heavenly Father, we are excited this morning about your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, the message of who Jesus is will be simple and clear and powerful among us this morning as we examine your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So if Jesus is the good news and the good news is Jesus, how do we clarify that? How do we explain that to other people? If someone says, what does that mean that Jesus is the good news? Here's what it means. The message of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished for us is the good news. The message of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished for us, that is good news. The famous British author H.G. Wells said this, I am an historian. I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. That's from a person who doesn't even claim to be a churchgoer. We believe this morning that the message of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished is the most important message in the universe. And that's why we're going to proclaim it every week and every day of our lives. We think that message is really that big of a deal. So I think the good news, that the message of who Jesus is and what he came to, to accomplish, can be summed up in three statements. Number one, Jesus Christ was miraculously born of a virgin because he is a supernatural gift. You see, if you're going to believe in Jesus, you have to realize Jesus was not just a man. He's not just one more person in the lineage of humans on this planet. Jesus is a supernatural gift. He is God come to us from heaven, placed supernaturally in the womb of Mary, and Jesus is not just a man. You know, talk show host Larry King was interviewed some years back, and someone asked him this question. They said, Larry King, if you could select any person in all of history to interview, who would it be? And Mr. King answered, he would like to interview Jesus Christ. And then the person followed with, what would you like to ask Jesus? And King said, I would like to ask him if he indeed was really born of a virgin, because the answer to that question would define history for me. You see, Larry King understood something, that if Jesus really is supernatural, and that changes the way we have to interpret everything in history. So it's a big deal. It's, it's a big crossing line for our faith. We have to step over that line and say, we believe that Jesus, the Jesus in the Bible, is not just a person. He is God among us. He is a supernatural human, not a natural human. He was born supernaturally, and he is God come to live among us. Number two. I believe that Jesus lived a perfect life on earth, demonstrating authority over sickness, demons, physical elements, and even death. During Jesus' three and a half years of ministry, he turned water into wine, healed the sick, healed the blind, the deaf, and the mute. He walked on water. He cured people of leprosy. He told a storm to shut up. He cast out demons. He brought three people back to life who were confirmed dead. The book of Romans calls Jesus the second Adam because he modeled for us a new life and a new way of humanity. Instead of falling into sin in the same trap that every human after Adam had fell into, Jesus did not live under the influence of fear and guilt and shame. Jesus walked in perfect moral purity and he demonstrated authority over all things that have terrorized humans since we fell in the garden. Jesus lived the life of a champion. Jesus was an overcomer. He never stepped into sin. And because he never stepped into sin, he never had to live with the things that sin brings, like fear and shame and guilt and condemnation. Jesus did not know those things. He walked in victory over those things. And he demonstrated perfect authority over demons, over physical elements, over sickness, over the human body, over life and death itself. So Jesus was miraculously born. It was God come to us. Number two, Jesus lived an amazing, victorious life over sin and death and fear. And number three, Jesus willingly laid down his life as a sacrifice and resurrected three days later. Jesus was not a victim of injustice. He was not a victim of cultural divisions or bad government. Jesus chose in love and obedience to lay down his life as a substitute for you and I so that through him we can escape the penalty of death. 
Jesus' ultimate goal was not to prove that he was better than us. His goal was to demonstrate God's love for us by addressing our deepest and most profound need, the need to be forgiven. Listen to this quote. I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. That's Napoleon Bonaparte who said that. Jesus came to establish his kingdom in love and sacrifice. He did not come to establish a kingdom by force and a show of brute strength. He came to build it upon sacrificial love. And that kingdom is marching on and on and on, and it will outlast every kingdom that's ever been invented by human ingenuity, by the work of someone's hand, or by the fear of a weapon. Jesus' kingdom will outlast them all. Even though I believe all three of those things are true about Jesus, and he was an amazing, amazing person on this planet, there is a tension about Jesus' life because everywhere Jesus went, people followed him who were not like him. He actually attracted uh, a rowdy crowd. Like everywhere Jesus went, the kind of people that you would not think about when you think about Jesus kept wanting to hang out with him. Sinners, people who um, did things on the weekend that I'm trying to teach my kids not to do on the weekend. Those kind of people kept showing up everywhere Jesus was. They liked him, they loved him, they followed him, they adored him, and it created quite a tension because other people who saw Jesus were like, Jesus, you're claiming to be this, so how come you keep hanging out with that? How do we, how do we reconcile those two things? If you're so wonderful and so holy and so righteous and you're God of God and you are victorious over sin, well... What about her and him that you like? You ate supper with last night and you've gone to visit them at their house and they keep following you around town. That's not what they are. And it created quite a bit of tension in Jesus' ministry that he kept attracting people to him that really never met his standard. In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, it says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complained that he was associating with such sinful people and even eating with them. It bothered some of the do-gooders in town that Jesus would associate with people like that. Can I tell you something? I am the do-gooder in these stories. I was always a goody two-shoes. And I understand not everybody's like that. Some of you cannot relate to it. But I was that kid that started crying before my dad ever spanked me. You know? If you, like, read the rules to me, I'll ask for a copy of the rules because I don't like breaking rules. My wife, we're not going to go there because she's a different brand of person. She likes to know where the edge is in life, and she likes to know that she can do things based on her own choice. And She doesn't like people giving her a list of rules. But I was that kid that everywhere I've gone in life, if you tell me what the rules are, I'm like, okay, okay. You know, I don't want to cause any trouble. No beef here, you know. I'm that person that when I get a speeding ticket, and I've got about four speed tickets in my life, like, I'm already, like, apologizing to the officer before he gets out of his car, you know. <laughs> really sorry about that. Really sorry. I know I was, I was going fast. Just write the ticket and give it here. I'll pay tomorrow. What time? You know, I just don't like breaking rules. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It just means I need to be really good about hiding my problems uh, so that people can't see it. Some people... You know, they don't mind being bold when they sin. I'm the guy who needs to be sneaky when I sin because I don't like for people to know that I got in trouble. And the do-gooders like me in town really were coming after Jesus because of these other people around him. And it led to this moment where Jesus told this famous story called, uh, in our Bibles, the prodigal son. In Luke chapter 15, verse 11, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. I have three sons. One can't talk in English yet, but if my younger son, Judah, ever came to me and said, Hey, Dad, if you can just go ahead and give me whatever I'm going to get when you die so I can be done with you, that would be great. I would be highly offended. I'll be highly offended. 
In Jesus' day, in Jesus' culture, this was beyond highly offensive. This was a profane statement. This is a young man going to his father saying, I wish you were dead. I want nothing to do with you, but give me what I think I deserve anyway. Very, very, very rude, selfish, crude way to address your father in Jesus' culture. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. Now, in the 1400s, when people first started translating the Bible from Latin into English, Someone, we don't know who, translated this story with a subtitle, and they called it in English, in Old English, the prodigal son. And that word prodigal comes from a Latin root, and it actually originally means someone who spends too much money. A spendthrift, a lavish spender, somebody who goes overboard. Somebody who has, uh, my dad would say, you have a hole in your pocket, you just have to spend the money you have. Someone who doesn't know how to stop spending money. That's actually what the word prodigal means in the original English. So it's supposed to be the story of the son with a spending problem. Now, when I read the story, I feel like the guy had, you know, a lot of problems, not just a spending problem. But he definitely had a spending problem because he took his inheritance and in a very short amount of time, he squandered it. He wasted it. He threw ridiculously lavish parties. And, you, you know, if you want to spend money on a party, people will come. Um, and so this guy threw wild parties, did sinful things, and lots of people came to help him spend his money, and before long, his money was gone. But interestingly, over the last four centuries, the connotation of this story overtook the denotation of that word, and people began to associate the word prodigal with running away, or someone who runs away, instead of a spendthrift. But today, I want us to go back to that original definition, that a prodigal is a big spender. So in this story, the son is a big spender. He spends too much money. He recklessly spends his money. He runs out of money, and now he has some very serious problems. This young man had a lot of problems, but his troubles can be summarized in one simple thought. He made a very poor exchange. He gave up a family, a fortune, and his future for a good time. And it's so easy to read the story and to look at someone and point your finger at them and say, that was really stupid. Why did you do that? Have you ever been prodigal? Do you wish that you could go back in time a few years to a couple of strategic moments of your life and reverse some of the exchanges that you've made? Have you ever given up too much of your future for a momentary pleasure? I know I have. I've been prodigal before. I've made a very foolish exchange. I've been in the moment and wanted something for myself and lost something I could have had in the future all because I wanted the exchange right now. There's a famous story in the Old Testament about a guy named Esau, and he was very proud of He came home from a hunting trip. He was tired. He was hungry. He was in a bad mood, and his brother was a, a swindler, and he ended up trading his inheritance for a bowl of stew. Now, that's a prodigal moment right there. He traded his inheritance for a bowl of stew. You know what, though? I've had those Esau moments in my life where I've made a stupid exchange. The truth is we have all been like Esau. We have all had our prodigal moments. In Romans chapter 1, verse 25, this is a description of, of all of humanity. It says, they traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. I don't know about you, but I have a sinister confession to make. I like to see people's mistakes catch up with them. I like it when what goes around comes around. I like it when the person who cuts me off gets a ticket. I like it when the person who was trying to get away with it gets busted. I think there is something about human nature that we enjoy seeing someone else get in trouble. And Jesus robs us of that pleasure by adding a twist to the end of the story. 
Verse 17 says, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I'm going to go home to my father and say, Father, I sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please hire me as one of your servants. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father interrupted him and said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. And now you understand why all the sinners loved hanging around with Jesus. Because he did things like this. He ended stories with someone, instead of getting busted, they get restored. Someone who should have been broken gets built back up. And those kinds of people who were very aware that they were prodigals and that they had problems and mistakes, they loved to hear these good endings in Jesus' stories. It gave them hope. Some people appreciate the nice ending at the end of that story. Some people think it's wonderful that the father, who is an image of God, would embrace his son. But some people have a hard time believing that God can be that good. There are fundamentally two questions, I believe, that people want to ask God in response to this story. Some people doubt the whole feel-good ending and that God is really that good. And I think that there's a lot of people on the planet who want to ask God this question at the end of that story. If you are so great and so good, what do you think about this mess? Why don't you do something about it? Or at least make a statement about all the hate and the violence and the injustice and the sadness and the suffering here on earth. If you're the God in that story, if you're the good father, and you're so rich and so nice and so wise and so wonderful that you'll run down the road and embrace your son, where is that good God now? Because when I look at the news and I read the internet and I, and I drive around town, I see stuff, I see problems, I see all these terrible things on the planet that you're not supposed to like. So why, uh, what are you going to do about that, God? Why haven't you done something about it? I believe God has an answer to that question, but a lot of people are not ready for that answer. I believe God's answer to that question will be to show you this image. No? We have an image? We don't have an image? Oh, thank you. I think God will show you this image. And he would say, actually, when you see the bloody, bruised, ravaged body of my son on the cross, this is what I think about sin. I poured out my wrath, my anger, and my white hot justice on the innocent body of my son 2,000 years ago because I hate sin. This is God's statement about all the problems and the junk that he sees on our planet. God has actually already told us what he thinks about the hatred and the violence and the abuse and the sin on our planet. He showed us when he poured his wrath out on Jesus Christ. And it's a disturbing image and it's a disturbing thought to think that that happened to an innocent man. But it was God's statement to us saying, this is what I think about sin. I hate sin. I destroy sin. And a lot of people don't like that thought because if I look at that image too long, it begins to bother me because I realize that, you know what, I'm part of the problem on this planet. As much as I'm frustrated by the sin around me, I know that there's actually sin inside of me too. And I'm part of the problem on this planet. But there are some people who hear the story of the prodigal son. And instead of asking God why, they're ready to take the question to the next level. And their question is this. So God, if that story's true and you're really God, what if I wanted to start over? What, what if I've discovered that there's a prodigal inside of me? 
And what if I'm not so happy with the exchanges I've made? What if I'm part of the problem? God, could I, could I start over like that? The young man in that story. God, could, could I step in to that story and be the younger son? Would you take me back? God, if you really are the father and you really are like that, are you telling me that today I can start over? And I believe that question is so profound. I want to share uh, a music video with you that celebrates that question and God's answer. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish and pay the price of their sin but instead have eternal life. There is an invitation given to you in God's word and there's an invitation going out this morning in this room for you to start over if you're interested in taking God up on his word. Ephesians chapter 2 is an amazing passage of scripture. I want to read to you Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 7. It says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. And listen to this. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all that he's done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. Do you realize what that verse is saying? It's saying that God's plan all along was to look at your debt of sin and pay it forward in Jesus, in his son Jesus, and to take care of your debt, just so that in the future, for all of eternity, God can brag about how rich his love and his kindness and his grace is in your life. God planned for you to be a trophy of grace. He's going to hold you up for all of eternity and say, look what I did, look that I purchased this man, this woman, with the blood of my son. You know what's crazy about the story of the prodigal son? The word prodigal means big spender. And come to find out, the son is not the big spender. The father is the big spender. God's the big spender. He looked at your debt of sin and he paid it full in Jesus. He paid with the blood of his own son. He said, I'll pay the entire debt. I'll lavishly give from my grace and my love and my mercy. I'll pour out the riches of my kindness for you to save you and to rescue you. And God paid a debt you could never pay. And he ransomed you from something you could never dig yourself out of. God's the big spender. He spent more on you the day that Jesus died on the cross than you can ever spend on yourself. And what's funny is the world is full of prodigal sons and daughters who are living in regret and they feel like they've made one too many bad choices. They've made one too many bad exchanges. They feel like, man, if God sees all these poor choices I've made, there's no way he can forgive me. There's no way I can be clean. And God looks at you and he says, you have no idea how rich I am. You have no idea the depths of my mercy and my love. You don't even understand that I'm a bigger spender than you are. I'm a bigger spender than you are. I spent everything to rescue you. I'll stop at nothing to pay the price for your sin and to bring you back to me. The, the father in that story really is that good. He really is that good. He takes broken young men and young women, people who have made stupid mistakes, and he runs down the road and he embraces you and he says, it's over, it's finished, it's forgotten. I love you. Start over right now. Can I tell you something? No one else in your life can offer you that kind of thing. 
No one. No one. Welcome to Good News Church, where we believe that the God of the universe is a big spender. He's a big spender. He'll stop at nothing to pay the price for your mistakes. And he will never stop inviting you back to him, to belong to him, to believe in him, and to be his. Christianity is not about what you do for God. It's about what God's already done for you. Too many people are afraid to walk in the doors of the church because they think if they come to church, somebody's going to tell them what they've got to do for God. This is not a church that's going to tell you what to do for God. It's a church that's going to tell you what God has done for you. The story started before you ever tried to do anything for God. I don't care what you try to do for him. It'll be nothing compared to the debt he paid for you. God is the big spender. He's the big spender. And today, he's inviting his sons and daughters to say yes, to believe in him. That's the invitation he's given us. It's an amazing invitation. And today I'm going to do something for just a few moments that's going to make some people in the room very uncomfortable, but I have to do it. I have to do it because truth demands a response. If you're in this room today and you feel a fire inside of you and you know that this is your moment, it is your moment to say yes to the love of God because you want to be forgiven. You want to feel clean. You want to feel like your life starts over. You want to know that you are accepted by God Almighty. And we're about to take communion. And you want to take communion knowing that you are forgiven and you are loved by God. For whatever reason, you've been feeling so distant, so far away. And in this one moment, you can take one step and be right there with your Father. I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask if that's you to stand up. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask people to go to you. Nobody's going to ask you for your name. After you stand up, I'm going to let you sit right back down. You may say, well, Pastor Thomas, what are you trying to do, embarrass me? No, I'm trying to give you, <laughs> I'm trying to give you something that you can't find anywhere else. And I'll never ask you to do it secretly because there was nobody closing their eyes and turning away when Jesus died for you. Everyone was staring at that naked body bleeding on the cross. Jesus very publicly paid your debt. And today, he's looking for people who will stand up in public and say, I believe in that story. I believe in that man, and I owe him my life, and I say yes to him. And I believe there's someone in this room that's ready to do that. Today, you're ready. Your heart is ready. You know it's time. I promise you this is not a gimmick. I'm not asking you to come forward or sign a card, but if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, when I count to three, I want you to stand up. Someone else is already ready. One, Two, three. Is there anybody that needs, you need to stand up and make that statement? You want to say yes to Jesus? Just stay standing. You don't need to move. This is about your heart. This is about your heart. It's all about your father. It's all about how much he spent on you before you ever woke up this morning. It's all about you learning that he loves you more than you'll ever love yourself. It's all about receiving. That's what this church is for. It's a good news church. We come here to receive. We don't come here to give. We just come to receive. And your heavenly father can give you something right now that no one on this planet can give you. And that is the promise. The promise of his love forever. The promise of his love. That you will spend eternity with him. Not because you're good enough. Not because you tried hard enough. But just because. Just because you said yes. Just because you said yes. So right now, those of you who are standing, I'm going to give you 10 seconds, 10 seconds to whisper your own prayer and say, Jesus, yes. Just whisper your prayer to say, Jesus, yes. Jesus, yes. That's all you have to do. Your father doesn't need fancy words. He doesn't need you to come up with something that's going to impress other people. He just needs to know that when he comes running down the road and he embraces you, that you're going to say yes. Lord Jesus, I pray for the brave people who are standing right now. Lord, I pray that they would not feel embarrassed. Lord, I pray that they would feel so grateful today that you would give them a gift. Lord, I pray that their hearts would be encouraged. 
to know that your word is good news. Lord, I pray that their past would be washed away and forgiven. Lord, I pray that you would release them from sin, from shame, from guilt, from condemnation, from regret. That they would no longer live in the past, but they would enjoy a new beginning that starts now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. I don't want you to feel embarrassed, but I want you to know something. Whenever you stand up for Jesus, he will meet you right where you are. When you stand up for Jesus, he will respond to you. He is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. He's a strong God. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward this morning. We're going to take communion right now. Communion is a celebration of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. For those of you who just stood up, I want you to know, this is for you. This is for you. This is your chance to physically celebrate what God's given you. We're going to pass these communion elements up and down the rows. Moms and dads, we're going to ask you to be leaders of your families, help your children understand. We're going to ask you to hold the cup and the bread and wait until we can all take it together. So just hold it in your hands while we are waiting for everyone to be served. That would be a great time for you. If you are a believer, to just whisper a prayer and tell God thank you for what he's doing in the service today and for what he's doing in your life. And once you have the juice and the bread in your hand, if you don't mind, just, just wait and hold it. We're going to take it kind of together as a family. It's a family moment. I grew up in church, and there were some times when my church took communion that I really struggled with that bread and that juice, and I thought, I don't deserve this. You know, I, I lied this week, or I stole this week, or I had a lustful thought, and God knows it, and nobody else knows it, and I can't take communion. Communion is not about you proving to God that you deserve something. It's not. It's not. God's not waiting for you to clean yourself up and get your act together. He's just waiting for you to believe. He just wants you to believe. That's it. That's your job. To believe that he's really that good. So if you've never taken communion before... The little cup with the juice in it is a symbol of the blood of Jesus because the Bible teaches us that it's the blood of Jesus that covers our hearts and washes away the stain of sin. So because of the blood of Jesus, God can look at you and see perfection. And you know what? Perfection belongs with God. When God looks at you and he sees perfection, he opens his arms to you. He sees the righteousness of Jesus and he says, you belong with me. The little piece of bread represents the broken body of Jesus. Jesus' body was broken so that your body can be restored. The body that you're living in physically is temporary. But if you believe in Jesus, one day you're going to get a new body. You're going to get a resurrected body. And you're going to live in heaven in God's presence with that resurrected body. And guess what? Nobody's going to have glasses in heaven. Nobody's going to need medical insurance in heaven. There's no goodbyes. There's no sad twist of stories. There's, it's, it's perfection. And we will bask in the goodness and the glory and the wonder of God forever. And that's God's plan for your body, to restore your body so that you can live forever in his presence. Jesus was broken so that you can be whole. So we celebrate that this morning. We celebrate that. It's a little cup of juice in the bread. We do it with millions of other believers around the world. This tradition is rich. People have been doing it for so long in so many different places. I've taken communion in, I don't even know how many countries in the world, and right now, there are people in other countries of the world, under trees, in simple buildings, in apartment buildings, in living rooms, under canopies, taking communion, celebrating Jesus, remembering Jesus, saying yes to Jesus. So if you have the bread, I'm going to ask you to hold up the bread this morning. I'm going to ask you to repeat these words after me. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. Jesus, I believe. Take the bread.
you have the cup, I'm going to ask you to hold the cup up in your hand. I want you to repeat after me. Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood. Jesus, in your name, I am forgiven. Sometime back, I found this amazing promise in the Bible. And when I found this promise, I made a decision that every time we had church at Good News Church, we would end the service with this promise. It's like a blessing that I'm pronouncing over us. It's called a benediction in church language. It's from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I hope you receive that as the people of God receive that blessing and that promise today.